Hello everyone, welcome to Tactica Imperialis and to today's video. Today is going to be my thoughts on for the Gloom Spite Gits, the upcoming slash already on pre-order Destruction Battle Tome for Warhammer Age of Sigmar, combining the Moon Clan Grots, the Spider Fang Grots, the Trogoths and the Gargants together into one mega faction. Now, this has been coming for a while. We knew Moon Clan were on the horizon from, I think, Blood and Glory was the open day, where or the studio preview where we got to see that the fact that Moon Clan were coming. I, I want to say Blood and Glory, uh, but we've known Moon Clan or something based on the Bad Moon was coming for a while, and they finally gave us the Gloom Spike Gits around about Christmas. So most of you have probably seen the Gloom Spike by now. Most of you know the models that are coming. Most of you have seen probably the preview articles. But I wanted to give my thoughts on them because the Gloom Spite, to me, are kind of exactly what I think Destruction needs. So I've ragged on many a time when I've talked about Age of Sigma that Destruction is lacking in books. It has the Iron Jaws, the Bone Splitters, the Beast Claw Raiders, and that's it. Um, no Foot Mounted Ogre Faction, no basic Greenskins Auric Faction. Uh, nothing with grots at all until this point, and it's been about 18 months since Destruction got a battle turn. So finally, with Gloom Spite, they're getting something that A, services the grots, which is a sub-race that they haven't looked at yet, and B, brings a bunch of factions back together in a similar manner to, say, the Beasts of Chaos when they were done around uh, September time. So that's all very good, and it also gives Destruction a very different way to play, because... Iron Jaws and Beast Claw Raiders are very heavy elite armies, often relying on big monstrous heroes um, and probably relying somewhat on cavalry to get their business done. Whereas the Bone Splitters have got a little bit of everything, but they're Oryx. They're not particularly Horde-ish. Well, they are kind of Horde-ish, but they're not a truly Horde-based army in the same way that, say, Death is. Uh, but nor are they a elite infantry sort of army, the same way the Iron Jaws are. They're not a cavalry army, the same way Beast Claw Raiders are. Um, they're a nice little spot that they're in, but it's not a huge spot. Gloom Spite has a little bit of everything. So you can play a full horde army by using primarily Moon Clan, using lots of Night Goblins or Moon Clan Grots, whatever name they choose to give them. Uh, I think Stabbers, I think, is going to be their official name. Uh, you can run a cavalry force, but it's a much more light cavalry force using the spider fang, the new squigs, and that sort of thing. You can have a very fast moving force. You can have a very monstrous force using the trogoths. You've got the new dankhold trogoths as your big guys, you've got the fell waters, and you've got the new rock guts. Also, I said the updated rock guts, which is um, rock guts, I think, not rock guts, sorry. That will give you some really heavy infantry. And you've got monsters as well in the form of the Arachnid Rock Spider, you've got Mangler Squigs. Generally, Gloom Spike can do a little bit of everything. It's got beat sticks, it's got magic, it's got monsters, it's got cab, it's got infantry, it's got heavy infantry. It genuinely has got something for everybody, which is something that Destruction hasn't had. And I think that's something that I think Destruction really needs is an army that does a bit of everything. Kind of. I don't want to say like Stormcast because they're a very different army. Uh, maybe it's not like Blades of Corn because Blades of Corn have a lot of infantry, cavalry, uh, chariots. They don't have magic, but they have almost something for everybody. And that's really good. So, what are we actually getting for them? Well, I'll go through this week's pre orders and next week's because they've both been published so we know exactly what's coming. And then we're also getting Urban Conquest, which is that's come a bit out of left field. They haven't really hinted at that much. Uh, so, the Battle Tome looking very, very nice with the Loon Boss, uh, which is kind of like the Loon Boss model that's coming out in the next set of pre-orders on the cover. Very, very nice. Thank you much. Lovely limited edition stuff. Standard fare. War Scroll cards. Nothing new here. And then models. We have, first off, Scragrot the Loon King. Oh, this is a very nice model. Now, the Moon, the moon Clan elements are very, very nice. Um... Obviously, I think the squigs have taken most people's interest, and mine included. But I think Scragrot is a really nice army uh, general. You can tell that he's a boss of the goblins. He's certainly a lot more than 
a regular grot because he's got all of this extra gear. He's got this massive iron type crown thing. He's got this little squig attendant, which I think is hilarious. And he's got the moon on a stick, which is also very, very nice. We've also seen his war scroll. So we know roughly how he's going to operate on the battlefield, which is very, very nice. And I think I'll get to that a little bit later, give you a bit of a taster. We've got the squig hoppers, uh, which can also be used to make the boing grot bouncers. So the squig hoppers are just light disruptive cavalry sort of thing, random movement, bit of punch, bit of speed, bit of disruption. They're fun. The boing grot bouncers are what I'm more interested in because it's grot knights on squigs. And that to me is just brilliant. We'll get to their war scroll as well in a little bit. But I just love the boing grot bouncers. And if I decide, which I probably will, to get a gloom spite army, I can guarantee you there will be at least one unit of boing grot bouncers in there because I just love the idea of cavalry generally. And uh, squig cav grot knights on squigs, yeah, please. Then we have the fanatics. So fanatics are obviously back. You get a free objective marker, which is nice. And you can also use them to make the Spore Splatter Fanatics. So the, um, the what's their name um, for this sort of version of Fanatics? Doesn't say here, but there's the regular ball and chain, what you're used to hiding your units Fanatics, these sort of smashy ones. And then you've got these Spore ones. Again, they're wall scrolls a little bit later, which really gives you a different dynamic of how you could play with a Gloom Spite Army, where you can mess with lines of sight, and there's various relics and traits that are about negative modifiers. So you can be very, very tricksy if you're playing down the Moon Clan route. Uh, the Squig Herd is also a new unit, and the Squigs are oh, the Squigs look lovely. Um, I've got a couple of Squigs because I bought Zarbag's Gits, the Warband from uh, uh, a Underworld's Night Vault. I have got a couple of the new Squigs, and I do really like the new Squigs, and these are all fantastically designed, they're all unique, and you've got the angler squig at the back there, you've got the one with the grot in his jaws, and there's probably a bunch of different variant components that you don't see here. So genuinely A plus on the squigs, they look amazing, and hopefully um, some orc players are getting some fun ideas for them as well. We also have the endless spells. Interestingly, we're getting four. I think this is the first time we've seen four endless spells for an army. Because the Beast of Chaos had the Razor Flock, uh, had the Mega Horn, and had the thing that really should have gone to the Chaos Dwarves, that big bull. Uh, Stormcast obviously had three, Nightbolt, Nighthorn obviously had three, uh, and there's not been another battle term since. This is the first time we've seen four faction specific endless spells. You've got the Arachna Cauldron, I think it's called. Um, I think these got leaked somewhere, or, sorry, not leaked, but turned up online. You've got this mushroom that shoots out. Um, sort of death fused or anything that's not a grot. The Arachna Cauldron is kind of like the grot answer to the Deus Arcanum. You've got the Bad Moon Killy thingy, and then you've just got a living carpet of spiders that runs around and kills stuff, which is all lovely and thematic. And you can see how they balanced it between the Moon Clan and the Spider Fang, and I believe that the um, like Tide of Spiders is easier for Spider Fang wizards to cast. So again, they're really playing into those two themes. Trogs do have a wizard. I've seen rules um, put online for a Trogoth hag, who I think is a Dankhold Trogoth made into a wizard, which is terrifying if you ask me. Um, but they don't seem to have a Trogoth specific endless spell. These are very grotty. Then we've got the Squig Dice, of course. Everybody knows about the Squig Dice. How well they're going to be balanced, I don't know, because they might be a bit hard to weight perfectly, but Squig Dice. Memes, Squig Dice, yes. And then up coming after them, we have the second wave, which is going to be the Rock Gut and the Dank Hold Trogoths. So you've got the Trog Boss, which is the albino one on the left hand side. Then you've got another Dank, a regular Dank Hold on the right. You've got the Rock Guts further below. And the Fell Waters are what you would know as River Trolls from Old Fantasy. And while well, they've not changed, they look fine. I'm not a huge fan of the Trogoths as a general rule. Trogoths are not really my thing. So if I do invest in a uh, Gloom Spite Armour, which I'm thinking will be my next project unless I get distracted again, I'll probably go down a Squigs and Spiders route and avoid the Trogoths unless I think, right, I really need a heavy infantry uh, element or I need a bulkier caster because my Grot Shamans are getting killed all the time. 
So I'll consider it, but I'm probably not going to go for them, but they are very nice models. Then, of course, we have the Mangler Squigs. Oh, yes. Mangler Squigs came out during the end of Warhammer Fantasy, the sort of last set of releases. Not the very last, but the last sort of pre-end times waves of fantasy. We got the Mangler Squigs, and they looked amazing. They looked amazing, but they were the wrong material. So now we get plastic Mangler Squigs, and they look great. They genuinely do look like unadulterated carnage on chains, which is what they're supposed to be. Um, I kind of prefer the unarmored version of the squigs as opposed to the armored version that you get for the loon boss on Mangler Squig, which is the one on the right hand side of your image here. So I kind of prefer this version to this version. I don't like the face plates all that much, but I can go with both. And if I do make a Moon Clan loon boss on Mangler Squig, I'll just take the face plates off and not use them. I'll just use the basic faces instead because I think they look better. Uh, we also have the Gobapalooza. I think, is it the Gobapalooza? Yeah, Gobapalooza. Also, Gobba or Gobbo. The Gobapalooza. Five heroes, uh, which you take as one slot, so you drop them all together. You've got um, the dude who stood on a dude in a squig skeleton who looks like the sun because he's supposed to be scaring them. You've got the collector with six limbs. You've got the dude sat on a giant mushroom who's probably hallucinating and tripping on God knows what. You've got the best Festus the Leech Lord or Maggot Kin of Nurgle Impressionist in the bottom right. And then you've got the guy in the top left and I don't even know. I think he's hypnotized some baby grot or snotling and it's just like... I don't know how good they're going to be in game but they look hilarious and that's the other good thing about Destruction. Destruction allows you to do humour, as long as you're careful with it. Because Destruction, if you read its lore in the rule book, generally has got a lot more humorous elements thrown in. Order is very serious. Chaos is very serious. Death is very serious. Destruction, yeah, they want to wreck stuff, but they're willing to have fun while they do it. And this gives the design team a chance to be creative and have fun. So I'm really glad to see this sort of thing. And then there's also... This guy, the Loon Boss, which is similar to the guy on the front cover. Personally, I think that the armor is slightly over, the, the helmet is almost overkill. I'd be tempted to take either the bottom part or the top part off. It would ruin the aesthetic, I know, but I, I'm not sure about the Moon Helmet because it's in like three pieces, it's a bit weird, but I can see why you might like it. And the base is lovely, I love the base. Uh, we've also got, uh, we saw the Snuffle Squigs, uh, which I think are genuinely the best thing. I love those Snuffle Squigs. I've forgotten the name of the unit, and they'll be out in the following set of releases, which presumably will be part of Wave 2 of Urban Conquest. Um, but, yeah, I just love these guys, the Snuffle Squigs, and um, I kind of wish I'd brought the webpage that they were up on, on because then I could show you them. They're just, they're just lovely. Um, I think that is everything, because I know the spider Fang are not getting anything new, the Spider Rider, the Spider Boss, uh, the Arachnarok are all staying as they are. Um, oh, there's also the Giant Terrain piece, that's the one. The Loon Shrine, I think it's called. And that thing is, like, titanically huge. Uh, so let's get on to some rule stuff, shall we? Uh, the Basics and Allegiance Abilities. So, again, you'll have seen this all before, but I just wanted to make a bit of commentary on it. Um, so, as you can see, nice Spider Fang option there. And i be honest, I really like the Arachnorok, so I'll probably end up getting an Arachnorok, because I know what I'm like. Um, and you can also have an entire squig army. Yes, it's, it is as awesome as it sounds. Excuse me. Um, so, yeah, this is the Loon Shrine. The thing is, like, ginormous. Um, and it also allows you to uh, recycle your Moon Clan infantry. So if you're playing a Horde-based army, you're absolutely going to take one of these because it's very, very useful, allowing you to recycle stuff. Um, the Allegiance ability, we haven't actually seen the Allegiance ability in full, um, or probably we have someone like the online previews of people who got the book early, but in these articles we didn't get a full preview. So we know that the Bad Moon is the sort of key point of their Allegiance ability, because the Bad Moon in lore is sort of the focal point for these various factions. Um, in terms of the Moon Clan, uh, they see it as the moon that Gorka Morka 
failed to eat, cracked his teeth on, and it became sort of infused with his power. The spider fangs see it as the egg of the spider god, that it didn't get it to stand still for long enough or hatch. And then the Loon King is trying to get it to stay in one place and follow it around using his crazy sea as in Shaman. It's all completely bonkers and it's brilliant. Um, and the idea is that the Bad Moon will buff you or damage your opponent based on where it is on the board. So it will track around the board and if you can set it up correctly and get lucky with it or have Skagrot, uh, the Loon King, to drag it around, then you can do some very, very powerful things with it, which is very, very nice. Uh, there's a nice little list of buffs here, which is pretty silly. So, enemy units anywhere on the board get whacked. Blue Spike get, Wizards get a plus one to cast under the moon, and enemy Wizards get a minus one. Ow, that's always good. Generals get an extra command point. Each hero phase, they're under the bad moon. So, something you'll see with the Loon King later is that Gloom Spike are going to be swimming in command points, potentially. I think that command point farming might be sort of their, um, sort of, USP, their unique selling point, as well as being what they are and all the crazy things that go with them. I think gameplay-wise, they're going to be Destruction's command point farm, if Destruction needed a command point farm. Because they've got a lot of heroes they can use, and therefore they want to activate a lot of command abilities, so the more they can get into their army, the better. So being able to generate more when they're under the Bad Moon is lovely. Squigs get run and charge, that's hilarious. Moon Clan Mural wants to hit, that's excellent. Spider Fangs do twice as many Wartal Wounds as they should do, which is very dangerous. And Trogoths get better chances of regeneration, or better regeneration generally. So, yeah, the Bad Moon is a very powerful ability, but it's a bit random. And that plays into how the Gloom Spike operate, and I think that that is excellent. And I really don't know how powerful it's going to be, and how much control you're going to have, but I think it'll be very, very useful in the early game to stop enemy wizards from casting quite as easily, and just generally blasting them with stuff, and then you try and drag it toward you, and that allows you to buff your army, or you just leave it hanging over there, and then you throw your units forward, and suddenly they get all the buffs under the sun, or moon, as it's more accurate in this case. So I like it. I don't know how powerful it's going to be, but I don't care. I think it's very, very fun. Uh, we're just going to a little bit of a look at their relics and spells. So the Moon Clan, uh, you get a couple of relics here. Uh, pick an enemy unit within 12 inches to track one from save rolls, for attacks that target that unit until the end of the phase. So if you really need a unit to just drown in attacks, perfect. And the Spiteful Prodder is a shooting attack. Um, pick a unit within 18 inches that's visible, then roll one dice for each friendly Grop unit wholly within 12 inches of the bearer, has at least five models. For each five plus, that enemy unit suffers D3 mortal wounds. Um, ow, genuinely ouch. So that's really good if you're running an MSU, uh, multiple small unit sort of army. So I think a squig hero who's running around with squigs and spiders uh, and lots of small units like that um, will really benefit from having a thing like that. Whereas someone who stood next to a couple of hordes of 40 will only get a couple of rolls um, as opposed to, um, well, anything else. So yeah, I think that's going to be an interesting one to try and maximize, but it's very, very interesting. We also get a teleportation spell, and that ain't dangerous at all, because it affects all Gloom Spike Git, so you can teleport your Trogoth, sucker. So, whip, yoink, bosh, have some Trogoths. Ow. Yeah, that could be very dangerous if comboed with Squigs, Trogoths, Arachnoroks, um, spiders in general, or just anything a little bit annoying. Like, even releasing, just sending some fanatics off, I don't know. Like, yeah, just teleport a unit of 10 grot archers, um, or something like that that's hiding some fanatics. Have them launch a charge, release the fanatics, and unleash hell. Maybe. Spider Fang. So, these guys, I think, will really benefit from the Spore Spider Fanatics, because they can get a lot of minus ones to hit. So, minus ones to hit for hit rolls for attacks that target the bearer. Uh, and a casting roll 7 that gives you, on see your next hero base, attract 1 for hit rolls for attacks made by enemy units whilst holding within 12 inches of the caster. So you want that on an Arachnorok Shaman uh, who gets in the melee, who's probably not going to die because it's an Arachnorok, and then they just pop this off, um, and suddenly everything within 12 inches is at minus 1 to hit, and your Arachnorok is just like, yay, you can't touch me, now nom. Hilarious. Uh, the Trogoths, um, there's a... There is a wizard for them, as I mentioned, but this is a um, relic for them, which allows them to ignore wounds, but 
has a chance of being eaten. So again, it's powerful, but random. It can screw you. You can lose this relic almost immediately if you eat it on a wand. So again, playing into that theme of slightly random chaos without being actually chaos. And then we get a couple of war scrolls. First off, we have the Dankhold Trog Boss. How is this going to come up on the screen? Oh, that's just perfect. So the Trog Boss, 12 wounds, 4 up save, relatively tanky, move 6, 4 damage d6 attacks with 2 render throw, that's going to hurt, um, and the Crushing Grip attack, which is basically roll equal to or greater than a model's wound characteristic and kill it. So... Yeah, kill a Mordenfang Cavalry on a 5+, plus. kill most heroes on a 4 or 5+, plus. It, that's dangerous. 4+, um, plus to ignore the effects of spells, which is very, very useful. Uh, plus 1 Bravery for Gloom Spike Gits, only within 18 inches. Uh, regeneration, hitting for D3 on a 4+, plus every hero phase. In the combat phase, you can just basically hit stuff with more Mortal Wounds. And I think this will be Destruction's Mortal Wound Output Army as well. Particularly if you're allying in Spider Fang, you'll get a lot of mortal wounds. And then command ability, pick a Trogoth hero with this ability into the end of that phase. All Trogoth units within 18 inches get rerolls of ones to hit in the combat phase. Um, ow, that's quite a powerful command ability. Thank you very much. The Spore Splatter Fanatics, I mentioned these guys earlier. So they're not going to hit half as hard as the Ball and Chain Fanatics. But D3 damage, D3 attacks, not to be sniffed at. Uh, and any Moon Clan units within 12 inches of them, or wholly within 12 inches, get plus one attack, which is exceptionally dangerous. Because if that's on a horde of 40 and somehow just stood right behind or right in front of these guys, all of them with plus one attack, that's going to hurt. You're running around with squigs or spiders that do mortal wounds, that's going to hurt like hell. And then the Spore Cloud, which means that you cannot draw a line of sight through a Spore Splatter Fanatic, which is very, very nice. Um, models are not visible to each other. If an imaginary straight line uh, drawn between the closest points of two models crosses over this unit or passes within one inches of this unit. <coughs> this does not affect them if either of the models in the line has fly, is a monster, or is from this unit. So, fine. You can't protect squigs. But if you just have a line of like five or six spore splatters, uh, maybe even with a second unit of spore splatters shielding them, you could basically create a nice like six to eight inch wall that your opponent cannot see across with their shooting attacks or with their spells in some cases. And while yes, that's dangerous, it is very useful for just protecting uh, certain key units in your line like spider riders or like shamans. I think they're probably going to be most useful with two or three of them, just shielding a caster to stop the caster being sniped off quite so easily. They can kill themselves, they're all double the charge, lovely, lovely, and they always strike first, which is very, very useful because always strikes first is a, was always a powerful ability back in fantasy, and being able to jump the queue and potentially just assassinate things means that a dude on one wound can't just say, oh, I'm just going to charge these fanatics and get a free point. Nope, they're going first. So it's something to keep in mind. Did it say what the other ones are called? Loon Smasher Fanatics. Sorry, I forgot their name. My bad. The Loon Boss on Mangler Squig. This is my shtick. I was just going to... Okay, there we go. So, 12 wounds, 4 up save. Bravery, 10. That's lovely. Um, not that powerful on his own. 5 attacks, 3 spores. You can eat a red cap mushroom once per game. It gives you a bunch of re-rolls. Uh, only for his attacks. These squigs themselves have got... Potentially 4 damage D6 attacks and 7 damage D3 attacks. Plus you then got a few more pokes, which is kind of nice. They can fly, which is lovely. Um, they get plus 1 to hit on the um, 7 damage D3 attacks that are rend 2. Um, on the turn they charge, which is very, very nice. They hit on 2s. Yes, Grot or Swig's technically hitting on 2s. Dangerous. Um, they also kill stuff if they die. So reach unit within four, six inches when it dies, or a four plus to take D3 mortal wounds. So you can just throw this guy in and get him killed, fine. And the command ability means that uh, in that combat phase you can add one to wound rolls for friendly squig units whilst they are within 18 inches of this model. So obviously this guy unlocks squigs as battle line, or squig hoppers, I think in Boingrot bounces as battle line. 
So that's going to be very useful for buffing them up uh, for the squig units to just get plus one to wound. And of course that affects this model as well, meaning it could be on the charge hitting on twos, wounding on twos with some of its attacks or wounding on twos and hitting on threes in some other cases. This unit is dangerous, okay? So I think this is really powerful. I don't know how much it's gonna cost. Obviously this is all without seeing costs. But I think that the Loom Boss Mangle Squig is a very powerful unit because it's guaranteed to kill something when it dies. And it's got so many attacks, your opponent has to prioritize killing it because it's got so many attacks through the squigs that it can just go on an absolute tear. Sure, its movement is random, but I believe there is a way to get boosted movement for squigs hidden somewhere in the book. So, on, obviously, under the bad moon, your squigs can run and charge. So you get the bad moon to line up for you, and all of a sudden, boing, boing, splat. Effective 5d6 inch hit range. How do you like them apples? It's, it's, it's quite fun. It's quite fun. Speaking of them, the boing Brock bounders, not bouncers, boing Brock bounders, sorry, um, they've got their poking lances, so two attacks, fours, fours with a bit of rend, um, and they get plus one to wound on the charge. So it's not great, but the squigs are very consistent, fours, threes, two attacks. So potentially four attacks at fours, threes, rend one, damage one on the charge is pretty good. And you also do some mortal wounds on the charge as well. So they're nothing special, but as a battle line unit that also packs a bit of a scary punch and is a very good assassin unit, I think they're going to be quite nice, and I'll definitely have some because drop knights on squigs, yes, bloody please. Finally, Scragrot the Loon, is he the last one? Yeah, Scragrot the Loon King. Um, he's quite flimsy, obviously. Six wounds, five up save. I don't even know how well this is going to come up on the screen for you, I'm sorry. Um, so he's got a really long range shooting attack with some rend and a decent melee profile. And if he causes an unsaved wound that is not negated, they actually specify not negated, then it keeps planking them every single battle round. So you just go, right, I need that guy who's got like four wounds or so dead at some point in this game. Aim, fire. Right, he's now just going to die. Just takes a mortal wound every single battle round. That person is going to die. And that's lovely. Um, you've also got the crown, which gives you plus one to cast, plus one to unbind, and a four plus ignore wounds which is very, very nice. And the Babbling Wand means that at the start of your hero phase, on a 4+, plus, you get D3 extra command points. This guy is a CP farmer, and it's nuts. It's really nuts. Uh, he also has a spell that allows you to steal-ish magical artifacts, so you do D3 more, which it's an arcane bolt with casting value of 8, which is terrible, but if you roll a 10+, plus, then the artifact of power that person is carrying is no longer usable for the rest of the game, which is very, very powerful because some relics are utterly terrifying and you want to shut them off, which is very, very good. His command ability as well is very, very important if you're trying to synergize with the bad moon because, oh, it's once per battle, never mind. Once per battle, if this model is your general, before you roll the dice to determine the movement of the bad moon, you can either hold the bad moon in place or make one or two moves that map around, do not roll to determine. We don't know exactly how that's worded in terms of the religious ability, so that's probably quite useful. So you could have it so the Bad Moon has got into position one turn too early for your squigs, your spiders, and everybody else. So it's like, Bad Moon, wait! Spend a command point, hold the Bad Moon in place just for one battle round, and thunk! Everything comes crashing through and you do all of the damage in the known universe. I think that's a little bit optimistic, but that's the idea. So... I think Scragrot's very, very nice. He's flimsy. Obviously, he's a grot. But I think you'll see some play, definitely some experimental play, just as a CP farmer to allow your Arachnoroks and your Mangler Squigs and your other Loon Bosses and your Spider Bosses and your Shamans and anyone else and your Trogoths and anyone else who has a command ability, really, to just keep using their command abilities as much as possible without having to spend all the extra points on Battalions. You just buy Scragrot and go with RNG. Let RNGs just take the wheel. And that's it. That's the Gloom Spike gets so far. So, as you might have tell from my sort of tone throughout this video, I'm very, very positive about the Gloom Spike gets. I think that they're exactly what Destruction needs. I think they're a really good breath of fresh air to AOS, adding in a new faction that can do all sorts of stuff and has a real diverse um, 
sort of way to play, which I really, really approve of, because I can do all sorts of different things, so lots of experimentation, lots of builds, and all that sort of thing is very, very nice. Um, how powerful they're going to be for tournament people, I don't know. I'm not a tournament gamer. Someone who is a tournament gamer, I'm sure, has probably dissected the book to death and already worked out the optimal builds for it. I'm not that person. But I think they're very, very fun. I think they're very, very flavorful. I hope the lore is really insightful. And I can't wait to see how they perform and probably end up playing them for myself because that's just what I'm like. Anyway, thank you very much for watching this video. I know it's gone for over half an hour. I do apologize for that. But I do hope you've enjoyed it nonetheless. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Um, as what I think we'll get in the future, well, we know Urban Conquest is coming very, very soon. The GZ and the Colts are just around the corner for thanks to the New Year's Open Day, which has obviously been crazy. I'm not going to do a separate video on that. Well, I might. I'll see how I go. I've got exams to prepare for. Um, so just let me know what you think in the comments below, and we shall see you very, very soon. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. Tactic and Imperial has been my thoughts on the Gloom Spite Gits. I'll see you all again. Bye for now.